Okay, welcome. Today we're going to start looking at Genius Spark. It's a book I wrote in November. I'm going to walk through the introduction and I'll tell you a little bit about where I'm at and what I'm doing. First, my name's Rex Miller and I'm in my cottage on a ranch called River Rose. It's a leadership center, it's 19 acres. We're 90 minutes south of Dallas Fort Worth. And we're in a beautiful location on the river, the Paluxy River. I'm overlooking that river right now. This is a 1930s stone cottage. To my left is the Montgomery Branch. It's a creek. And guess what we found a week ago? We found a theropod footprint. That's a dinosaur. And what you may not know is that Glen Rose is one of the premier centers or locations to find dinosaur fossils and footprints. We have a state park called Dinosaur Valley State Park, and you can walk amongst hundreds of large footprints, and we found one in our creek a week ago. Thank you for coming to Genius Spark. If you've been following any of the posts, then you know a little bit about what we're doing. But today, I'm going to start with the basics. Go to the beginning and why I wrote the book, and a little bit of the behind-the-scenes stories. For me, a lot of this started in childhood, trying to find out who I was, what I was best at, and I'll walk through some of those successes and trials and tribulations and when I first found out what I'm wired to do best and enjoy most. The book opens up with a quote by Sir Ken Robinson, Essentially, and if you don't know who Sir Ken Robinson is, the first thing I'll suggest that you do is go to his 2006 TED Talk entitled, Are Schools Killing Creativity? He based that TED Talk off of research that I'm going to share by NASA in a little bit. And his conclusion from his years in education is that we don't grow into creativity, we lose it over time. And I think we all sense that. We all sense that there's something inside and sometimes just waiting to get out, waiting to rec get recognized, finding the right venue. And yet we live in a world that has expectations and norms that we spend most of our energy living up to. Sir Ken Robinson's talk goes into the conforming conditions that once we were kids and then we go to school and then we turn into a person in the first story her name is Rachel in her 30s she's looking at pictures of who she was as a child and seeing that bright-eyed adventuresome curious little girl who could make friends with people easily was confident and then over time, she's wondering, where did that all go to? Where did the feeling go to? And she's contrasting that to, she's got a great life, good job, strong accounting firm, kids, good marriage, everything is good. But it just isn't her. And that's how she laments. I think a lot of us have felt that way at times. You may feel that way now. And if you do, I'm telling you, there's a road back. I'm going to share with you my road to getting into that rut of being very good. I call it being successfully normal. Then it took an outside event to shake my life up in the early 2000s with the dot-com crash and 9-11 that let our business just tumble. That was my rude awakening call. We'll get to that in a little bit. Now, Walt Disney is one of my heroes. Walt's quote is, the more you are like yourself, the less you are like anyone else, which makes you unique. Let me repeat that because I know it sounds simple, but it's really profound. The more you are like yourself, the less you are like anyone else, which makes you unique. He also said that the problem we have today is we have too many copies and not enough originals. 
What I'm going to help you discover is how do we find that unique factor we all possessed, we still possessed, but it's buried over life's experiences and disappointments and other people putting us down and expectations and pressures and all of that stuff. I'm telling you, it can come back alive. Now, part of what we've learned is that we were socialized out of that uniqueness that we had, starting in school, learning how to sit straight, sit in rows, answer standardized tests, be graded on a bell curve. All of those things over time help us lose that curiosity, willingness to try things and be wrong and then try to figure out what's the right answer. For life, many of us have been trying to find out what's the right answer, but we never get to that right answer. It's elusive to us. For me, going through that process, I went to seminar after seminar when I got out of college, trying to figure out what's the right formula, what's the right process. What I'm here to tell you is that we're not going to give you the five-step formula for successful sales, for finding your purpose. We'll tell you how to go about doing those things, but it's not an easy formula or package because nobody's like you. Nobody's wired like you, has the DNA you have, has the experiences that you have. Nobody's like you. There's not a one-size-fits-all approach. We'll move into how to discover that unique self that you have and the journey that you'll take. There is a framework for the journey that we all take, but it's not the same for anyone. The interesting thing is that NASA conducted research in the 60s and created an assessment. It's called the Imaginative Index. What it's meant to do is to find out levels of creativity, and it was for picking astronauts to go to the moon. So they wanted to find out to what level of creativity do they have. I'm going to pick up this skippy peanut butter jar. But the question was simple. How many uses can you think of for this jar? And it's timed. What they're looking for is what variety of answers can you come up with? What is the novelty? What is the quality of those answers? And then they rate it. Now, George Land, who Sir Ken Robinson references his research, who created the assessment, was so struck by the simplicity of this assessment, the imaginative index, that he decided we can give this to children. And so what he did was give it to three to five-year-olds in the Head Start program. What astounded him and amazed everybody involved with it is that 98% of the 1,600 kids tested as geniuses. So now you want to ask the question, as a scientist, I wonder what's going to happen over time. So what he did is he set up a longitudinal study and he retested them every five years through high school, and then once they got to be adults. Now, 98% are geniuses, five years old. The next major event that all of us go to is school. Five years later at 10, he tests all 1,600. It drops from 98% who maintain that curiosity, that ingenuity, that unself-consciousness that we all have. And then just in five years, it goes from 98% to 30%. Five years later, at age 15, it goes from 30% down to 12%. And then at age 30, it drops to 2%. They then tested over 280,000 adults and found that this 2% remained true. Now, if you have a small child, a toddler, or you have a grandchild like we do, and he comes to the ranch every Sunday, you will see a very different look at the world, the curiosity. They look at things and don't look at it through their functional use. 
they look at it through their curiosity lens. One of the things our grandson loves to do is pull out all of the pots and pans in the cupboard. And he puts those pots and pans on the floor and he'll wear it as a helmet. He'll play it as a drum. He'll put water in it. He'll put dried peas and just play and touch the texture and hear the sounds. All of that swirling stuff. And the interesting thing is, totally absorbed, completely fascinated over and over again. It's the same routines. In our front yard, we have a little bridge. And we can spend 30 minutes him just going back and forth and back and forth and looking at the shadow. And then if I step on the grass, because it's usually in the morning and it's moist and I'll step on there, he's fascinated by the footprints. Where did all that fascination go? Where did the ability to get completely absorbed in simple little things go? Part of it is the education machine that we were raised in. That's part of the challenge in the journey is that then we become the copies. It's Walt Disney's. We become copies and we follow these copies hoping to achieve excellence in some area. And we follow this person's pattern and formula and this person's pattern and formula. And I don't know if you're like me, but I followed most of those and I found ah, 60, 70% of it is good, but the other part just doesn't fit. And therefore, their formula or system really doesn't work over time or I can't sustain it over time. And that's because it's not natural. It's like putting on a coat that's too big or one that's too small. You can get into it but it really doesn't fit and therefore it feels awkward all the time and self-conscious. So you never get to that mastery level. You only get to mastery by mastering yourself, being that best version of yourself. Now for me, what happened is that I was 45 years old when the dot-com crash hit in 2000. I had just moved from Virginia and moved our family to Texas, and it was a very young family at the time. And I got a vice president of sales position with a 10-year contract, supposedly, that would allow me to retire in 2010. You can see that didn't happen. Our business was very tied to telecommunications and technology, and that's what got clobbered in the dot-com crash. We lost 70% of sales within a half a year. And over time, and we all took pay cuts and the owners took no salary. It was survival mode. We had a very good owner who was fiscally responsible with no debt, so could ride this out. However, the harsh reality is that we needed sales and losing 70% of sales meant I needed to let go several new salespeople within the year that were going to be the next generation of our salespeople. We had several who had been with the company for a long time and were good, what you might call account reps. They handled current accounts well, but they weren't bringing in new business. So I got a new crop of people who were more of what we call that hunter style of individuals. I had to let them all go, which was crushing for me because I had recruited them and we had all these opportunities and aspirations and gone. One day I come into the office and my email's not working. And naively, I'm thinking it's a technical issue because this was in 2000. Email was about as sophisticated as we, you would get in terms of technology. So I go to Walt, our technology guy, and I say, Walt, my email's not working. Can you help me? And he hems and haws and says, you need to go talk to the owner. So I go in, and the owner, who's been a good friend of mine since 1978, is just antsy, and I think the only way he could handle this is just to get angry. So he said, we don't need a VP of sales. We need sales. Ripped up my contract and said, you've got two choices. You can either leave now. Or you can go back into sales on Monday, straight commission. What did that mean to me? That meant 
that I went from having a nice salary and having a home in a nice mid-level executive community and our kids in a great school to now I've got zero income in the kind of sales that, that I was involved in. It's a nine month to 18 month sales cycle to begin to even see some revenue coming in. I was financially on the straights immediately rotating credit cards, $150,000 in credit card debt within six months, and struggling for my life. Now, during that time, too, the stress and the pressure resulted in I wasn't a good dad. I wasn't a good husband. I was 50 pounds heavier than I am today, and I was lost. The career that I thought I had was gone. The future that I thought I had was gone. And my purpose and meaning was all tied up in all of those things, providing for my family and making that better future. It was all gone. Then I discovered this new book that came out. It was called Now Discover Your Strengths. And the authors were Donald Clifton and Marcus Buckingham. It's the first version. You're probably familiar with StrengthsFinder 2.0, but Now Discover Your Strengths has the first part of the book going into the history and the research and how they developed it, and then talking about the 34 strengths that they identified, and then I took their assessment. And what I got back changed my life. It gave me insight into who I was, why I enjoyed some things, what came natural, what didn't. I started finding a huge misalignment between things that I was very good at, but really not passionate about, not wired to do. And what I didn't realize is that when you're doing something, even if you're good at it and you're not wired naturally to do it, then it's work. It feels like work. It's draining. It takes effort and it drains you faster. Conversely, when you're doing things that you're wired to do that come natural to you, that you enjoy, they're easy. And the work you do is naturally better. I started to see and discover that. Then some of the lessons from my mentor started to come together. The midlife crisis is a real deal. In fact, last week, I was coaching an executive from a large healthcare firm that I'd known gosh, since 2013, covered their project in one of my books. And now they had left the organization they've been with for a few decades. Life totally changed. He was 45 and family relationships completely changed. His whole life orientation changed. And he was at that midlife crisis moment of, I built all this, but it's not me. That's probably a normal course for many people because we grow up and we're shaped and molded to play the game, fit into the system, play by the rules and try to climb the ladder of the game. And somewhere about 45 years of age up into the 60s say, you know what? I'm just not happy. I'm bored. I don't know where this is going. Essentially, it's putting your ladder up the wrong wall. You were climbing the ladder, but it was the wrong wall to climb up. That's where a lot of us tend to get to, is that we're doing what we're doing, and then we feel trapped. How do I make a change? I'm not just going to go off, write a motorcycle, write my memoir, and eat, pray, love. That's not realistic. That's not going to happen. So how do I manage this gap between the two? Not to give away the whole story, but part of managing the gap that I discovered, staying put in that environment, eating crow, <laughs> humbling myself. You can't imagine having been vice president on Friday and, and coming into the office and being just another salesperson and then having somebody who was in the warehouse that I had brought into the company as a salesperson who was doing well, who was now my boss. And, you know, it. You could tell everybody was uncomfortable. It was like I had a terminal disease and nobody knew how to talk to me. But the book was showing me that I could be just as happy and successful in any situation as long 
as I was tapping into what I naturally did best and enjoy most. And sure enough, that's what happened to me. Now, it took me several years to dig out of the financial hole, to repair relationships in my family, to get physically well. But in the process, I became the most successful I had ever been in, the, in this industry, in that little dealership, by continuing to play to my strengths and doing what I naturally do best. And I was able to leave on a high note and leave at the pinnacle of my success and feeling like I had kept my obligation to the company because I said, I'm committed to help this dealership get to where we agreed we were going to go. And when, I, when we got there and when I reached that level of success, I said, this is not what I want to do the rest of my life. And I had built the bridge out. Some of you may be wondering, how do I build the bridge out? And you can contact us and we can have a discussion on building the bridge out of the current thing you're in or the situation. You may come to the conclusion that ah, I'm not a fit here. This is not good. Don't make any sudden moves. Get to know yourself better and better. There's lots of research about finding meaning in the situation you're in. If you're in one of those challenging places that is soul-sucking, there's two things you can do to turn it around. One is to get that intrinsic boost, that internal chemical boost on doing things your way, that unique wiring that you are. Number two, find meaning that there's something bigger and beyond this that I'm doing for me. It's shaping me. It's building my character. There's lots of writers of stoicism. Ryan Holiday's book, The Obstacle is the Way, is a good book. Or even Viktor Frankl's book. He wrote it after his time in Auschwitz. He found that the people who survived had something they were living for beyond themselves and bigger than themselves. His book is Man's Search for Meaning. When the external world shakes and crumbles in front of you, even relationships, those two things you have control over. And another Stoic philosophy is know what you can control, know what you can't control, focus on what you can control. What I learned is that I can control showing up at my best. I can control going out into the marketplace in my way of doing it, uniquely to me, which is building trust and solving problems, not selling people or closing them. It's building trust and solving problems. That was my unique formula. And it can work extremely well. Now, what enabled me to do that is the Clifton Strengths Assessment gave me a roadmap to who I am at my best. Getting back to that five-year-old self and understanding what was going on in my brain when I was at my most creative and now beginning to find examples daily of where that pops up and, and then reinforcing that. So summarizing, and I'm reading off the book here, everyone has the capacity to be exceptional in your unique way. And beginning to recognize your blind spots or the areas that you own your potential in, that's what assessments help. And oftentimes it takes an external trigger to get you to realize this isn't working, I'm on a treadmill, and I'm not getting any further. How can we do this? What, where can I go? And an assessment or an external event will wake you up to say, I've got to do something different. It's interesting. We want to be the best. But that's an elusive goal. And I sought to be the best in sales and management, my company. You can't control that. What you can control is to be your best. And, and then that was a shift in focus for me.